Well, welcome to our sixth session in a series about parliamentary process and Robert's rules. Today, we're going to be looking at the different roles individuals have in the conduct of a meeting with Robert's rules. So let's get to it. So when we think about having a meeting, we really want to think about uh, several key items. Don't meet unless there's meaningful results that can't be accomplished. Having meetings for the sake of meetings doesn't help anyone. If you've got complex tasks, we wanna break them down into doable actions. That's a key thing to think about. We want to set specific meeting objectives. We talked about how important the agenda is. We want to be prepared, assigning people roles. We want to know what the action items are going to be. And when we're all done, we want to debrief, examine what happened at the meeting, what worked, what went wrong, how can we improve for the future. This should be just a natural thing you do every time you conduct a meeting. You're going to be dealing with controversy. And as a result of that, it's important to be ready for it. And if you are dealing with an issue involving money, you're bound to have strong actions in terms of support from the pro camp and the contrary camp. It's to be expected, so be prepared. Research what the benefits and drawbacks are related to the issue that involves money. Are there alternatives? If necessary, refer to a committee, even though you don't have one, create an ad hoc committee if you have to, so that more study can be done, because that's usually what's, what, what's needed. We need to do, uh, get more information, do more reflection before we bring it back to the uh, members to vote on. And you know, if you are ready, make sure that, uh, especially for the chair, the chair is doing everything in their power to alternate between the pro view and the contrary view. Go so back and forth, yes, no, back and forth. And, and you should be as the chair speaking like that. Who'd like to speak for the motion? Who'd like to speak against the motion? Who'd like to speak for the motion? Who'd like to speak against the motion? Because you, then you show yourself to be fair, impartial, and everyone's here, you know, listening to both sides of the issue. I worked for many years in a, a legal firm as a law office administrator. And the one thing I really did have impressed upon me is that every issue has two sides to every coin and they're closer to each other than most people think. And so there's going to be in any given issue involving money, an active and vital uh, debate, discussion, whatever you want to call it. So as the chair, you should be prepared to anticipate what's going to happen. Other considerations. Now, some members will come to the meeting and abstain. And there's a lot of controversy about members who abstain. I have the view. Thank you so very much for coming to the meeting. Help constitute quorum. You have the right to abstain. Good for you. And it doesn't matter if an issue passes because we had members who abstained. That was their right. And so if there's a motion passed, um, and there were abstainers, they cannot be compelled to vote, uh, that motion will be validly adopted. Um, presiding officers and some bylaws are given the rights to um, break ties, you know, that fair enough. Sometimes there is a person designated to be the tiebreaker vote. Certainly it helps if you can organize, you know, especially if it's a board or corporation where you purposely make sure that the number of board members are odd in number, not even, odd. And that, that helps the decision-making process. If necessary, if the issue cannot be um, really um, identified in clear order, then refer to committee for more, uh, more, more study. Um, presiding officers cannot make motions, nevertheless, they can lobby for them. I'd like to have, some, uh, now, there's nothing to say, uh, nothing to stop the presiding officer, um, presiding officer, the chair, from saying, boy, I would really appreciate if someone would make a motion that we uh, pass the minutes to circulate. Oh, are you going to make that motion? Great, Madam Recording Secretary, this fellow over here is making a motion that the uh, minutes be adopted as circulated as a secondary. Oh, thank you so much. There's nothing to stop you as the presiding officer from lobbying. 
that's quite appropriate. And if you have to, you pass temporary control of the chair to someone else, take your place on the floor as a member of the group, and then you can speak your mind. But in the role of the chair, you're impartial. So there's several key meeting roles. That's the heart of this session today. The presiding officer, who's the traffic cop, who's directing traffic, the recording secretary, the credentials desk, scrutineers, the parliamentarian, and the sergeant of arms. These are all different um, roles that are contained within the format of a meeting. The presiding officer directs traffic, instructs the recording secretary what goes into the minutes, should have a basic understanding of how Robert's rules work, needs to be fair and impartial, needs to be briefed on matters listed in the agenda, uh, has a duty to keep to the matters of the agenda, not bringing in secondary issues, has a duty to avoid wasting time for the members, and calls the meeting to order and adjourns the meeting. The scrutineers are two individuals that are appointed. They have the respect of the floor. They're widely recognized by members as uh, you know, impartial individuals. They will collect and count written ballots uh, when there's a voting by ballot. And at the request of the chair, they may assist the chair by counting the votes, uh, where people are showing their vote by show of hands. It's a passive role, only pressed to duty at the request of the chair. But you appoint the scrutineers at the beginning of the meeting. And again, they're individuals that are widely respected by members of the group. The credential desk is all about um, you know, enforcing bylaws. Usually there's a standard by which a member is designated to be a voting member. And so they come to the meeting, they come to the credentials desk, they pre pre present their credentials. Sometimes it's a, it's a membership card, fair enough. And they uh, may receive a paddle with a different color. So when they hold up the paddle that people know that they're authorized to vote maybe ribbons, I've, I've seen a variety of things, you know, a colored sh sheet of paper, all that works. And the credentials desk will provide a written report um, of who has arrived as registered members that are eligible to vote to the chair, and this will help the chair to determine whether or not quorum has been established. Some chairs will call for the chair of the credentials desk to um, you know, uh, make a report you know, openly to everyone. Did we meet uh, the requirements of quorum? Fair enough. And so uh, that's what the credentials desk is all about. There is a role called parliamentarian. It's not a well understood role. It's uh, for a person who has a working knowledge of uh, Robert's rules and parliamentary process. That person also has an equal duty to spend the time and the care to read and have a working knowledge of the bylaws of the organization at the same time. They have a passive role. They never interrupt the chair. Their role is to assist the chair upon the request of the chair. Sometimes the uh, chairman gets overwhelmed with the technicality of an issue and it's nice for the chair to say, please hold a minute, everyone, I'm going to turn over to the parliamentarian. Mr. Parliamentarian, what is your advice on this matter? Because what you're doing, the chair is calling for expert advice. And so the parliamentarian will rise. I've served in this role many times, and I've been caught just exactly like this. And I, I'm anticipating an issue going on. I go, oh, this could be about two thirds vote. And uh, the issue came up, you know, how, how much do we, we need to uh, pass this uh, piece of business? And the chair says, I don't know. I'll look at the uh, parliamentarian. And I was ready. I said, two thirds is needed. Two thirds, section 43 of the bylaws. And the, the chair was, uh, was pleasantly surprised. He goes, perfect. Okay, so two thirds, everyone. And so that's the real role of the parliamentarian to, to be there. Now, what I'd like to do when I am in this role, I like to meet with the chair beforehand, talk about the agenda, strategize a little bit, offer some advice, some suggestions for their consideration. That's an appropriate role for the parliamentarian. And I also believe it is part of the job of the parliamentarian to, to at the end, when they are finished and the meeting is over, they've been taking notes of how everyone's been doing in their roles. 
and they provide a written report, an exit report, a debrief report, if you will, that speaks to how well people did, what could be improved, and what practice should be considered to be adopted for the next meeting. That's an appropriate role for the parliamentarian. Sergeant at Arms is a person that um, you know can introduce the the presiding officer, can make all the housekeeping announcements, you know, turn off the cell phones, where the restrooms are, and in the case of fire, where are the exit locations, and their role is to uh, close the, the doors, the entrances to the meeting. That's not to say that people can't come and go, but the whole idea is to try and eliminate distractions. And, um, you know, in, in, in very, very extreme circumstances, Sergeant at Arms may be asked to eject a member who is um, belligerent and not paying attention to the instructions of the chair. Though I have never in my, my 20, 30 years of being a parliamentarian, I've never seen the need for, for that kind of action by the Sergeant of Arms, but potentially that could be a responsibility they have. So there we are, those are the different roles that uh, work together when we're running a meeting under Robert's rules. Hope you found this session useful. If you have, please hit the like button. There'll be more sessions to come. If you want to uh, see future sessions, please hit the subscribe button. And um, there's a notification symbol as well. Feel free if you have any questions about the material we covered in this session or the ones that, that are, uh, have been previous, or you have to have a, a basic question that you've encountered as a problem with a parliamentary process, feel, feel absolutely free to uh, give me a comment in the comment section. And uh, trust me, there'll be more to come. Look forward to the next session. It's all about running meetings and less time more efficiently.